Are you seeing double? Or did Blackmagic really make a new full-frame cinema camera? This was supposedly the camera we wanted, but as many netizens disappointed instead. Looking past the specs, it was compelling enough that I paid $500 more to get it. So, was it worth it? Welcome back, ghosts. This is the Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K. You know, just in case you had any doubts that this is indeed a cinema camera. I suppose other brands could take notes with this nomenclature, so I can feel more validated for buying a Rolex Luxury Oyster Perpetual. Only once you've correctly searched for this full frame model in L mount, you'll see there are a few new and old features from the pocket cameras. The build is nearly the same, and will be able to support rigs and accessories from before. For those that are new to the Blackmagic system, you'll likely be disappointed with this build quality. The carbon fiber body feels like a plasticky Instax, and I'm not convinced of its durability or long-term value. This might be necessary as the camera already has considerable heft, and a metal body might push it over the scales. Given the large fans and lack of weather resistance, I would not trust bringing this camera to the beach or out in the rain. The weight and bulky shape make it unideal for gimbal work. However, I find it ideal for handheld. The grip is large and protrudes forward like a gun, which makes the torque with one hand or vertical operation difficult. But it's actually quite ergonomic when filming with two hands. This shifts pressure from your right hand to your left, which will also be burdened by the warm fans beneath the camera. The product also comes with a good strap, suggesting that this could be a run and gun daily travel camera. The comfortable rounder edges of this camera make it so that when hanging from a strap, the sides never dig into your body, unlike rigid mirrorless cameras. The body also hides a sleek CF Express B card door, but it's obnoxious to open. I'd say Blackmagic is trying to take design cues from Apple, except for the fact that this might be the ugliest camera on the market. On a more positive note, the rubber gripping is lovely, and the interface is best in class. The 5 inch tiltable screen makes it so you really don't need a monitor. The menus feel great and are responsive, though the majority of inputs need to be through the LCD, and I wish the front command dial could also adjust some sliders for one handed operation. You'll probably only notice this and try to return to the record screen from playback. I love the function buttons, but I wish there were more as I have many unused buttons and my copy can't map the autofocus button. With built-in and downloadable LUTs, you get a cinematic filming experience. And with immersive screen real estate, it's like you're watching your own movie live. You'd want to shoot all day if it weren't for the misleading battery indicator, which I think can last four to five hours when filming on and off. Two to three batteries should be enough for a traveling day. With other small rear LCDs, I find myself psychologically filming closer, as I can't see my subject or focus peak clearly. This is not the case with the 6K full frames premium screen. The camera supports all the functions you'd expect from a cinema camera, like the very handy framing guides, focus tools, false color, some anamorphic D squeeze, time codes, HDMI, mini XLRs, but is missing some questionable features. There's no electronic level, no SDI, and no internal NDs like the previous generation. It gets an optical low pass filter instead, which reduces more and IR pollution, allowing for very clean blacks. If image quality is more important than practicality, you'll like this change. You can also only film in B-Ron now with very limited high frame rates, maxing around 36 to 48 frames per second without crop. However, you do have the option to film an open gate, which is great for anamorphic and reframing. Despite some reservations with the build and customizability, this camera is extremely enjoyable to film with. Was it fun to edit? The reason this camera has received criticism is the downgrade on paper. There are no more ProRes codecs, no internal NDs, limited frame rates, and worse rolling shutter as a result of the shorter mount and larger sensor leading to slower readout. Rolling shutter is noticeable when panning, especially in open gate at 25 milliseconds, 
and improves as you change resolutions. With 10ms being ideal, you can get a respectable 15ms when shooting around 2.4 to 1, though I normally shoot at 6k DCI for reframing and file sizes. In DaVinci Resolve, you can use the gyro data to greatly reduce shakiness and rolling shutter from pans, though I didn't notice any improvement for horizontal tracking shots. The gyro stabilization on this camera is a major reason I would choose this camera over another. While running and gunning with IVIS cameras, I've always felt that the result was too jerky with the exception of Panasonic. But gyro stabilized footage really does look quite natural, and feels better to me. The crop is considerable and can still get warping, so I'd suggest 0.2 strength. Although I would love internal NDs, I wouldn't want to use them if they had IR pollution like the previous model, and LLPF is a great side grade. Full frame overall is still an improvement. Perhaps the market has already spoken, but if you don't like this camera just because of the paper specs, then this is why we will keep getting updates like 18K resolution rather than meaningful updates. To get the most of this camera, you definitely want to use DaVinci Resolve, which comes free. RAW is a fantastic workflow, and I suggest filming at 8 to 1 compression on default. At 12 to 1, you can notice a significant decrease in quality. 6K footage runs pretty smoothly on my M1 Pro, as B-RAW is optimized for DaVinci Resolve. But if it does stutter, you can play back in 4K. Once you've nailed down a workflow with this camera, you'll love editing Blackmagic footage, but that's easier said than done. If you plan on transforming to Rec. 709, there are overwhelming options for input color space and gamma. If you shoot in the log profile called Film, you'll want to use one of the film inputs. I prefer Gen 5 Film Gamma as more contrast, whereas Blackmagic Design Film and Gen 4 Input Gamma are flatter. I think you can get similar results with any of these, but you need to adjust for the base contrast. If you prefer softer looks, I suggest Gen 4 or Film Gamma, and then converting to RE color space, as I personally find black magic color separation to feel clinical. The dynamic range is tricky on this camera, though much better than the FP, as I found the files to be a bit underexposed from what I saw from the screen. I recommend exposing to the right, because there seems to be more upper headroom, especially with highlight recovery. Despite the shadows having depth, they can clip earlier than expected. You want to avoid low light when possible, as there's color shifting, especially indoors, and the fixed horizontal noise pattern is very unpleasant. However, the optimized noise reduction in DaVinci Resolve really pins it up nicely. With the native ISOs of 400 and 3200, you'll want to shoot nighttime in the upper ISO range, though I found 1250 to have good noise performance and cleaner shadows. If you want to shoot in the daytime, the 400 ISO bracket will give you the most dynamic range. The sensor requires abundant light, but if you have it, you'll find that the camera produces a beautiful image. There's no bigger upgrade in image quality than a new sensor. I didn't jump onto the Pocket 6K Pro despite the internal MDs and EF mount pieces of crop. I actually don't mind shooting Super 35, but that's the limit, and the old Pocket 6K cropped past Super 35. One aspect of full frame image quality that many don't acknowledge is the better full frame lenses. Brands naturally devote more resources in developing full frame glass as they are more expensive and will usually receive modern innovations. To get the look of full frame f1.4, you need something like f1.0 on APS-C glass, which is rare. Then you have more spatial depth, which makes objects, textures, and locations more dimensional. With the bigger sensor, I'm able to see all the character of my full-frame Zeiss Otis lenses, including the vignetting in the corners. Regarding the actual image from the camera, it excels when there's plenty of light and leans toward brighter visuals. When you shoot in the day, you get very general images, and the OLPF helps with cleaner, softer visuals, despite the 6K resolution. The camera has the same tried-and-true 12-bit black magic colors, which perhaps is a little oversaturated in the green channel with strong color separation, allowing for complex color grading. For those new to the system, you may find the colors to pop, which may be suitable for commercial work, but not what I prefer for narrative. And with general base contrast, it could be attractive for those chasing softer visuals. It's surprising that the image never feels too sharp, and does produce an immersive image. However, highlights are strong and overexposed workflow 
tends to shift toward a commercial look. It definitely beats mirrorless hybrid cameras, but I wouldn't say the image feels as cinematic as RED, RE, or arguably the FP. You can particularly feel this in skin and hair texture if you spend enough time comparing footage. However, I think many will still prefer the image out of the black magic, as people typically gravitate towards better images and pop. With a bit of highlight reduction, I think this could be a great beat cam for RE cameras, as I find highlight roll off in RE color space feels good on this camera. Conversely, I don't find the shadow roll off and noise to feel graceful, and can render plasticky skin textures at night. The strengths and weaknesses of this camera are clear, and although it's just missing a secret ingredient of organic texture, I think the gorgeous full frame depth makes it very appealing. But in today's market, is that enough? About five years ago, Blackmagic was a market disruptor. It was defiant to own a pocket cinema camera and was amazing value for the money. I think it's very reasonably priced even though I overpaid for mine, so I may be more of a camera villain than usual in this review. Despite a full frame sensor, I don't find the camera to be particularly innovative relative to earlier generations. It seems Blackmagic has become complacent and won't commit to a direction. I'm not talking about the box design, as I may be one of the only few people that likes how they made this camera with the handheld shooter in mind. Ultimately, creators should love this camera, though I think this tool is good enough for the working professional that values image quality over function. And although it doesn't have SDI, I think there are legitimate workarounds for the greatly exaggerated grievances. I'm pleasantly surprised how good gyro stabilization is, and for me it makes a perfect run and gun camera. However, the image didn't initially blow me away like the FP. This is a reversal of emotions. Although I'm excited to shoot with this camera because of the filming experience, I find myself just satisfied by the image texture and color. Nevertheless, it has beautiful visuals and will shine for run and gun, commercial work, and daytime shooting. If I was a betting man, I'd wager that there will be a new version of this camera in one or two years that will actually have a pocket design. There were rumors in development that this camera would have a boxier pocket shape like the FX3, and that might still happen. Why else would they remove pocket from the name of this camera if not to update it with a pocket version? But for me, I've already skipped the 6K Pro, so this is where I've settled with no regrets. The world of cameras is always improving. And where does the filmmaker go from here? The net is vast and infinite.